So um, it's uh, 11 um, Eastern um, and 8 Pacific now. So we'll just go ahead and get started. And uh, uh, good morning, afternoon, good day, good night, everyone. We have people from different time zones, <laughs> including me. But um, uh, thank you for joining our webinar here. Um, and uh, um, I'm Sarupya. I work for Groundhog. Groundhog is a mind digitization and software uh, automation platform. And our goal here is to educate everyone on digitization um, around safety training. And we have experts here, um, Ken and uh, Colin, um, who would be sharing their stories, their views uh, today on um, this topic. This is a three-part series. So today we'll focus on safety training mostly, and then we'll follow up sessions on compliance and risk management as well. Um, so having um, said that, let me give a quick round of introductions um, and then we'll get started. Um, Colin here is a mining engineer and turned safety professional. And he has more than 17 years of mining experience, 12 of which have focused on health and safety. He has spent more than a decade working in various parts of the mining industry, both domestically and internationally, building and implementing safety-focused management systems and processes. He brings a multifaceted perspective that encapsulates all facets of the mining profession, including engineering, capital projects, operations, maintenance, safety, and occupational health. Welcome, Colin. Thank you. Ken? Um, Ken is a mine safety professional with over 25 years of mining experience and primarily underground. And Ken has worked as a miner, a mine rescue team member, emergency response coordinator, volunteer firefighter, emergency medical technician, and is currently a safety health superintendent with a mining contractor. Welcome, Ken. Thank you. So, um, now, um, we'll just go jump into the topic directly. And uh, uh, both of you have basically been champions of using digital tools to improve health and safety in your organization. So maybe we can start with a high level view of your approach towards designing safety programs in your organization. And then maybe we can follow up with an example of a project or initiative where um, you use digital tools or where digitization of safety training was implemented. So um, the platform is all yours if you just want to get started. Yeah, yeah well, sure. I'll, I'll yeah, go ahead, Ken. You, you go ahead, Colin, jump in there. <laughs> so I, I don't know if you would call it the pleasure or displeasure, but I've had the opportunity to uh, to go through this a number of times in my career and build programs effectively from the ground up or modify ineffective programs. And, and for me, it really starts out with a, a, a gap analysis and gut check of where that operation is, right? What do we really need? What's going to add value? What are we capable of for a maturity standpoint? Because you walk in the door in different places, and their, their level of maturity and acceptance of digital practices can be quite a bit different. Uh, I look at what's going to add the most effective value, what's the highest priority based on either uh, reoccurrence or frequency or potential severity. And then based on those metrics, you really have to put together a roadmap and a timeline, right? Because functionally, it doesn't matter if it's a, a training digitization and incident management digitization. They're just systems. It, it's just a program and the quality of your outputs are reflective of the quality of your input. So you have to have a, a game plan and a strategy when you build these things. So you have to look at it from what do I want at the end and then build that on the upfront to, to make those deliverables, right? So starting off with, with risk management is, is always my priority. Employee risk, right? What's going to prevent our people from becoming injured and hurt? What's the compliance risk? How am I going to keep me and my, my fellow co-workers out of the uh, the place with the bars and the orange jumpsuits? And then what's going to de-risk the company, right? Whether that's an ESG risk or an environmental risk, all those things play into it. And then from the, the training de-risk side specifically, how do I ensure that people have the proper training to continue work? Do they have you know, part A training versus part B. Do they need experience minor versus hazards? And there, there's a lot of gray area within part 48 that we work in. So having those things as, as predetermined based on specific criteria in a digital platform really helps streamline that process. Ensuring people have the, the right task training for the job and the equipment. Uh, and Ken, I'm sure you've seen this all the time in your career. You get a 5,023 back that says mucker on it or forklift. Yep. That, that doesn't work, right? So we, we need to know that people are effectively trained on the, the right equipment. And then how do we produce those documents? 
right? We, we've all sorted through the filing cabinets on filing cabinets that have people and have been gone from the company for 10 years and nobody purges them. They're not organized. They're not standardized. So looking at, at those things to produce the quality of output that you want at the end. I, you know, honestly, you, uh, I think you hit it right on the head. You know, it, the, the sum of it for me is you, we have to look at the long game where, where we want to end up there. There's obviously the, the short-term goals or the short-term needs that need to be taken care of. First and foremost, those are the people. Um, there, there are a lot of things that we have to do around that regulatory wise, but the, I think probably any safety professional that has to deal with the training records, training of employees, um, they, they've all felt the pain of not really having a system in place where it's, it's one person that's the go-to that they, they handle all the training records. If you need any information about the training records or training plans or training packets, um, all of that stuff, it, it's all one person. And the, the digitization of it, makes it accessible to so many people you still have to have some security on the on the systems themselves um, but making it more accessible so that people can see what's going on where it's happening um, and understanding what the long game is and where we want to be makes it a system and it gets everybody working together as a team yeah I, right i just touching on that you said the s word which i'm really fond of system and i think that's a fatal flaw in our industry when we talk about developing systems is we create something that's dependent on one person. And that is that is not a system. And I think digitization helps spread that load where it makes things more accessible. And we truly have operating systems where people can input and export that information more readily. Agreed 100%. Any, any examples of projects or initiatives that you've taken where um, you've seen implement a long term, you had a goal, um, work towards it through digitization, maybe some examples that you can share? Uh, well, you know, since I, I started at the project where I am now, that's been eight years ago. Um, like many mining companies, um, it, it was very paper heavy, right? There's, there are, there's always printed forms, there are things that that need to be managed. And for whatever reason, um, you know, whether it was a hesitancy to, to use electronics underground or just out in the mine itself, whether it was the age of the, uh, the employees and how familiar they were with electronic devices and working in a digital world. Um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not a necessarily a spring chicken myself, but I, I am kind of a, a, a technology nerd, I guess, to, to some extent. So getting people to, uh, to start utilizing the, the digital portions of it and, and getting people to, to see that in the long run, it really does, aside from building a system, it can be a time saver, a, a huge time saver, because you don't have to worry about printing all the forms out. You don't have to worry about filling them out by hand. You don't have to worry about um, scanning them and then saving them. Um, all of that, all of that that goes along with it. There's, there's a whole variety of ways that you can go about digitizing something. And in a very rudimentary fashion, I've been trying to do that at the project that I'm at now since I started. Um, the problem is, is that until we, until we stumbled upon a manufacturer that had some, a specifically designed program for it, it had basically been it hadn't been systematized. Uh, there were certain people that had access to it. Certain people didn't want access it, access to it. But still, it basically relied upon one or two people that were running the whole thing. Any system has to have an administrator, but in order for it to work well, just like Colin said, everybody has to be able to, to pitch into it. Since we've started doing some digitization, I, I think probably one of the, the one that uh, really comes to mind for me right now is, is two faceted. One, uh, recently we started doing digital um, digital record keeping for our annual refresher for all of our new minor training and for our experienced minor training. Uh, just the annual refresher training alone, I, I, I could probably put a number to it right off the top of my head. 
but just suffice it to say that um, not having to go through all of the, the lists over and over again, pre-populate 5,023s or the training certificates for the employees to make sure that the, the information that's required to be in the, in the document is there so that we don't have to go back to them later on and chase them down and, ha and have them re-sign a, a correctly filled out document. Collecting all of those, making sure that everybody turned them in, scanning them and filing them for a digital thing where with the, with the right digital software, the certificates are all there. You have people sign on, the, on their spot on the roster and it generates all of those training certificates right then and there and it automatically files them. Uh, the other thing that we've recently started doing is a digital powder inventory for our explosives handling for underground. Uh, we started that here just a week or so ago, and our guys are, the, the guys that have been using it have, uh, we've gotten really good feedback on it. Um, it makes it much simpler for, for the guys to be able to use. There has, in the two weeks that we've been using it, uh, we're getting continual feedback good feedback for the most part um, and always some feedback on how we can improve things. Sometimes it has to do with the digital portion of it. Sometimes it has to do with some, some other aspects of it. But, um, but to me, as far as a, a system goes and bringing the digital world into mining, which it's slowly been creeping in anyways, um, to me, that's a really good indication that the, that we're ready to, to move forward with it because we're getting buy-in from the people that are actually using it. And they're, they don't feel like it's being forced on them. It's something that they're used to using. These are people that grew up in a digital age anyways, and it, it's something that they're familiar with. And if we can work with a manufacturer and make these things as simple and as user-friendly as we possibly can, that just increases the buy-in and moves us more towards the digital age for mining because people see that it actually does work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and really I've been doing the, the same thing and just speaking most recently uh, here at, at Nevada Copper, I've, I've really started the, the, the proactive and reactive uh, approach to digitization of our safety training. So the first one is cleaning up the historic records, getting everything moved from filing cabinets upon filing cabinets, sorting through who's here, who's not, and bringing that into the digital system to make that more accessible, not just to me, my team, but, but to operations as well. Uh, standardization of the training process is huge, right? So now that we are, are moving into a digital world that's easily controllable because you're creating a competency-based checklist. So you're moving from a compliance-based training system to a value-added training system where you're assessing a person's ability to safely execute a task or safely operate a piece of equipment versus the old thinking was, do they have the 5,023 in the file, right? Are we compliant, yes or no? We're, we're moving past that. Uh, standardization of the organizational structure within training, so the creation of task codes that feed off of each other, and think of it like a, um, a course catalog for a university where you have to take you know, Math 101 before you take Math 102. You can do that within the system so that they can't progress to that next step unless they have the prerequisites done. And then creation of, of job requirements, and this is one of my favorite things, is when I get a new employee, I have a certain list of criteria based on that person's job. So if they're a general underground miner, okay, they come in with a, an active and valid uh, annual refresher certificate, they need experience miner training, but what else do they need, right? So for us, they get their experience miner cert, they get their task training for the use of the, the cage and the shaft, they get a task training for scaling, one for workplace examinations, one for UTV operations, all the things that are encompassing their, their job and they're not effectively signed off to be a, an NCI underground miner until all those tasks are done. Whereas before it was, here's your experience miner, uh, now go underground and go to work, right? The, so it, it's, it's allowing us to prioritize those different training topics, keep track of those topics, and then work through the progression stuff as well. So, right, you can, you can link those up with your, uh, your tech levels, your tech ones, two, threes, fours, and fives, as you have progression. So that's been a, a significant boon for us. Now we're, we're still developing, right? There, it's, a, it's a long process. 
uh, because you know as Ken knows in this profession we uh, we spend a lot of time putting out fires so you really can't dedicate a hundred percent of your time to the creation of these strategic deployments but uh, you, again you go back to that game plan that what do I want at the end and you keep moving that that ball forward um, it's been a, a huge time saving for us Colin I think it's pretty interesting that you you mentioned that because we just recently started uh started a we're calling it a, a progression path right um you know within established mining companies and just just thinking digitally or whether you're doing it in a in a little booklet or you're looking at the 5023s um at, at least with contract mining um you know if even within the same company if if we've got people that may be transferring from one project to another one mine to another um, you know, and we're expecting a, call it a minor one, um, you know, a, a, a top level hand full cycle minor. And, and all we're getting is a 5,023. We're getting the training document that shows he has annual refresher training. Um, you, you really don't get much of a background other than just the resume and speaking with them. Um, and, and also just like a, a lot of places, the, the, uh, the progression of that minor is um, unfortunately very often subjective to the to the supervisor to the project superintendent or, or whoever it is that that's yeah. responsible for making those promotions um, at, at least with this we we're able to uh, to put something into place that that tracks the development of that employee it focuses on the development of that employee and if they if that employee wants to be able to move forward, um, or move up within the company, improve his skills. It gives us a way to be able to track it, and they just and they simply can't proceed until they get to that point. Um, and, and the other aspect I think that you touched on is the for the new minor training. Um, absolutely critical. All of those things that you mentioned. Um, you, you know, there there's a couple of different ways of doing that new minor training, but. There are a lot of things that go by the wayside if, if all you're doing is the, the classroom portion of the training. And there are a lot of skills that, or a lot of tasks that a new miner needs to understand and needs to be competent in before they're turned loose in the workforce. Even just simple things like, like making a hose or, uh, or, or driving, a, driving a, a UTV or a light vehicle underground. Um, and, and being able to manage those prerequisites with something that's at your fingertips that the supervisors can look at because it's it's set up for them to be able to look at, or even just as simple as uh, as a supervisor who has another miner coming in working overtime, and being able to at his fingertips just say I, I need somebody to run an LHD or a haul truck or a jumbo or a bolter, and just key that information in, this is what I'm looking for and automatically get a list populated of all the people that have that particular training and they can decide where they're gonna put that individual. Um, I, I think you touched on, on several things that we've just recently started doing where we're working now. Mm -hmm. So, um... I mean, this comes back to the topic of personal uh, personalized training, right? So uh, you're now able to do personalized training. How do you um, stay up to date with your training programs when you have to be so personalized? And how do you ensure, um, how do you evaluate the training programs that you design um, in this digital um, structure? Well, I, I think doing the, the evaluation is, uh it is a little easier or, or at least modifying the, the training programs. Um, the, the nice thing is, is being able to, to look at each portion of it. The, the evaluation is, is a constant and ongoing thing. Um, at a safe work practice, an SWP, a, a policy, a procedure. Um, you know, we, I, I think we, we get too focused on those. They are very important. And the goal is, is that they're there to show the, the way that we've defined to be able to do things, hopefully as, as safely as possible and to maximize the efficiency. But that being said, um, technology is changing in the mining industry all the time. Um, people that are 
are invested in what they're doing are constantly looking for ways to improve. And if, if we rely on one or two people to make those changes or to, to determine where that path is gonna be rather than opening it up to the entire workforce and including them in those evaluations and those revisions to the practices, uh, we're making a huge mistake. So we're constantly talking to people watching out in the field, um, not only what they're doing, but how they're doing it and, and trying to make those, uh, make those changes so that it is, it's not just do it just because we said to do it this way. The, the evaluations come from watching the guys talking with the guy. This is, this is just as safe or a safer way to do it than the way that we have been doing it. Um, and, and ultimately all that stuff written on paper anyways, there are some things that literally are an act of Congress to change. Um, but for the things that are at a company level, um, the majority of it's written on paper or, or it's, it's written on screen and it can be changed. You, you have to pay attention. You have to, you have to look at what the potential risk is. You don't want to use a knee jerk reaction. Um, so it does take a little bit of work, but evaluation and, and changing the way that we're training has to be a constant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're kind of in, in the same boat. I, I look at it from a, a stakeholder involvement perspective, right? As a, a health and safety professional, I'm in a support group. I, I'm a support network for the operations for the production of the material that we're mining, right? So I, I like to engage them and digitization has really helped that significantly and changed the perspective from this is safety's job to manage these documents to how am I going to use this information readily in the field? Or, or even things like line out, right? You have a guy who dumps a shift, you were going to put on a jumbo. Now you can pull up your tablet, scroll through, say, okay, this is task training code BLT001 uh, for putting in swell X bolts or putting in Dewey DAGs. This, all these people are trained and you can do your reassignments in live fire um, instead of doing the, the crew shuffle, right? To see who shows up or not. Uh, but we, we have to look at opinion of the stakeholders. We also look at things like reduction and in incidents can correlate those two back and forth. Is the quality of our training reducing the frequency and severity of our incidents that we're seeing, especially property damages and, and those type of things. So, and if the, the engineer side comes out every once in a while, I really like looking at the statistics of these things. Uh, <laughs> infield evaluations and competency assessments. So when we go through and do an, an infield training, so it starts with a classroom and ends with a company assessment from health and safety before the 5023 is issued, we, we have somewhat of a check and balance system between operations and safety. I can look at the competency evaluation on the individual metrics that we score one through five by job classification, by work group, by operating division, and then I can retarget future trainings based on those statistical metrics instead of doing it on a periodic basis. Instead of saying, okay, well, once uh, every 90 days, I'm gonna take a random selection of jumbo operators and go down and, and do an evaluation. And say, you know what, the jumbo guys, they've, they've been good. They're, they're like a 4.6 out of five on all the performance metrics, but I wanna go take a look at the, these mucker operators. They're not doing so well. And we can mm -hmm. do that and compartmentalize those things to be more value added. Right. As safety, I, I think we, we try to do the shotgun approach, right? Everything is broken and it all needs to be fixed right now versus using digital platforms and, and statistical tools to tell us where we're going to add that value because our, our time is finite, right? We only mm -hmm. have a certain amount of time in this world to, to dedicate to these topics, whether it's being proactive or reactive. So if we can use that time more effectively, we're creating more value to our, our, uh, our clients, essentially. Mm -hmm. Very well said. <laughs> okay, maybe uh, switching gears a little bit, uh, you had touched upon this um, employee performance measurement. Now that it, with digitization, it's not very dependent on one or few people, right? So uh, maybe if you can elaborate a little bit more on how do you go about um, uh, setting safety baselines and performance metrics and so forth, um, and how do you ensure that all employees, including those with limited access to technology can participate, participate and benefit from any digital safety training programs. Sure, so we, uh, I think we do a lot of the, the statistical analysis on the lead, lagging indicator side that, that most folks do. 
from the, the training side, because we've moved to a digital platform and more importantly, a standardized platform where we can compare apples to apples, not apples to oranges, we, we can benchmark against ourselves in those different operating divisions. Or if you have a, a company that has multiple sites against multiple sites, which we're, we're getting there. Um, but we can look at things like, like I said, those competency evaluation, those scoring metrics. We can look at the on-time completion of those infield evaluations. Are we getting those things done proactively as a leading indicator? I, I think those help out um, extensively. And for the, the integration, that part it, I say is a little more difficult, right? If, if you're moving to a digital platform and someone doesn't know how to turn on a computer or still has a flip phone, there, there's only so much you can do, right? But we, there is the ability to, to print out the old school uh, matrix and plot it out on the wall so they can go up there and find their name and figure out what they're signed off on. So we, you still have the ability to do that. And we, we do that every once in a while to update that matrix. But I, I'm trying the best I can to, to move into that digital platform. So all of the, the, the shifters uh, either have or are getting tablets, tablets in the equipment. We have the, the QR codes that we've handed out where people go put them on their hard hats. Um, so we can go up and, and scan them and see what they have. Um, so it's less about the, the individual employee, uh, the rank and file miner and their access to the system as it is the operational leadership to make sure that they have readily and quick access to that information. If the, the, the rank and file guy wants to see what he's task trained on to verify it, we'll do that printout and, and put it on the wall. Yeah, and, and I think the, uh, the digitization, a, a lot of the hang up um, with digitization, it, it, some of it seems to come from being able to get the information across, right? Um, there, there's a lot of hang up and I think a lot of hesitancy that goes along with with digitizing a mining environment um, because they're in, in often cases, um, mines don't have stretched all the way through them. So what we're finding uh, working with, with different manufacturers and, and looking at the different digital applications is that in many cases to to be able to utilize the digital information, depending on what it is, you, you don't need a digital network readily available. You can still pull that information up. It's still stored, um, you know, like Colin mentioned, the, the QR codes, uh, you know, the, the training information for, for employees with one of the programs that we're using is stored within that QR code. The employees don't even have to have the application downloaded onto their phone. They can scan load, they can scan that QR code and they can bring up a, a training matrix and be able to see what they're currently signed off on or a supervisor can check if they you know if they don't remember that a, an operator maybe had been signed off on a piece of equipment um, or they're they're curious about you know maybe how long they've been running that piece of equipment they they can scan that code and pull some information up and it's right there at their fingertips and any changes to it, with the with the right developer, those changes can all be uploaded at the end of the shift, um, which which does allow for more digitization. I think that's that's been a, a huge hang up with it. Mm -hmm. um, and how um, and then you mentioned some um, metrics there, but what kind of data and analytics do you, have you used um, to determine the effectiveness of either personal or your tra training programs? Ooh. Colin, I'm going to let you take this one. <laughs> uh, I mean, some of them are quantifiable. Some of them are, are not, right? So the if I'm looking at the success of the program um, from my team's perspective, uh, are, we, are we able to access that information easier than we were before, yes or no? Is the system built on one person now, yes or no? Or, or can multiple people get to the same stuff? Um, we look at uh, the, the transitional roadmap, right? Are we hitting those milestones of moving from a compliance-based system? Is the, the file there? Or are we doing competency-based evaluations and training versus time dependency, right? Are we, are we standardized across the organization so our, our, our training is effective that we have uh, OJTs who are doing training the same way, right? Because uh, one of the, the, the fatal flaws in, in training 
especially the way that it's written in part 48 is once you're a competent operator, you can then go and train other folks, right? Competent and very loose quotes to defining how, what that really means. But it's like making a copy of a copy of a copy, right? If, if I'm teaching Ken and I forget one thing and then he teaches somebody else, now that person forgets two things because he forgot the thing that I told him plus whatever he forgot, then the, the quality of that training degrades over time. And that's when we start having significant issues, either injuries, property damage, or, or, or operational issues as well. And we can't forget about that side of it. So we, we can look at some of those statistical metrics uh, like we talked about before, but a lot of it comes down to the, the non-quantifiables and the transition and the thought process of training from a compliance-based system to a, a quality-based system and an outcome-based system. And one of the, the best metrics that I look at within my own team is, are we able to spend more time doing value-added work? Right, because we, we in this profession, especially, and it's even changed in, in the time that I've been doing it, we're very burdened by paperwork, absolutely. And and the more that MSHA has, and then companies were going through ISO, we were doing core certification, all of these things that require additional documents and SOPs and document control and updates. We we find ourselves strapped to these desks and these computers versus having those interactions in the field. Right, and that's where we truly add value because the, the, the prevention of incidents doesn't come down to any program that I've issued, any digitization that I've ever done. It's having people make positive choices about their actions and how they interact with their environment. And we do that through conversation, right? So if I can, if I can free up time with my group by in, implementing systems and processes, where they can go out there and have those engagements and do those hazard inspections and work with people in the field, then I know that I'm being more proactive. Uh, in general, and, and more of a philosophical type thing, but it, safety is a difficult thing because we're, we're in the business of prevention. So we're trying to quantify something that doesn't exist. And this is one of the, 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 the critical like mind shift moments that I had switching from engineering to safety. As an engineer, I can justify my existence through increased production, decreased cost, uh, quality improvements, whatever system I'm designing and building. But as a safety professional, I'm trying to quantify and qualify something that doesn't exist because I don't want it to happen, right? The, the more and better work that we do, the fewer people get injured and the fewer violations that we get. So the closer we get to zero, the better we're doing, which is transitionally opposite from the rest of the operational world. So we, we have to look at things that are not quantifiable for the most part to try and judge that success. Okay. Any views there? Uh, Colin said it beautifully, way better than I could. <laughs> okay. So um, just switching gears a little bit to more compliance and risk management, we'll just touch upon the topic and then we'll elaborate in the next um, sessions. Um, uh, but um, what are your views on integration of uh, digital safety training with other safety programs, whether it's emergency response plans or other incident management procedures? Yeah, I, I mean, training integrates with everything that we do. It doesn't matter if it's our, our monthly mine rescue training, updates to emergency response plans, escape and evacuation plans, ventilation plans. It all de the level of training depends on your level of engagement, involvement, and whatever that topic may be. So if I update an emergency evacuation plan for the mine, I still have a requirement that I have to train people into the changes that are effective within that plan. So you create a, a training um, system or a training topic that's basically an acknowledgement of that procedural change so that you can document, okay, these miners have been uh, provided the information and the, the change in, in this evacuation route or the, the change in this ventilation system, and we can move forward from that point in time. So it gives you a, a, a dot on the map of this was the change, these people have been trained and these people haven't. That, that helps out quite a bit. Effectively, what we used to do in line out meetings, right, where we passed around the sign in sheet, we can now do that by having people sign on the tablet and it produces their, uh, their digital record automatically. So that helps out uh, quite a bit. Um, it also helps out you know, in, in the unfortunate side when you do have incidents 
and you have to do production of documents. Uh, you know, MSHA has this list of things that they want, and they want all the training records for all the involved personnel, and um, it makes it easier to to grab those things. Now, MSHA and their their infinite wisdom and fatal flaws, they still want that stuff digital or a hard copy, right? So you have to to print it all out, but it makes it more accessible to retrieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it it makes it a one stop shop, and you know, I, I think Colin was right. Just we're actually. Uh, I, I actually hadn't even considered the uh, like doing the the updates for emergency response. We're we're going to be updating our mind maps here shortly, and typically, you know, we'll throw something up on the screen. We pass the the sign in sheet around, and we're and we talk about it and and go over it with everybody. Um, but that's uh, that's one thing as we move forward to having our guys have the accessibility to be able to pull that up. Um, not only can they then see it, they can look at it in their own time while we're talking about it. But if they, if the program is set up right, they'll have a map right there that, you know, depending on the device that they're using, but they can, they can pull that up and they can zoom in on it, all the things that a digital platform can do. Um, but it, it really does make being able to, to keep track of, of all of those things that I hadn't really considered at this point. Um, I, I can definitely see what Colin is talking about there. So I, I got to thank Colin for, for pointing that out because that was an aspect of the, of digitizing stuff, making it accessible to our employees that I haven't considered yet. Yeah. And, and I found that too. And whether it's a learning management platform or an auditing platform, there's always something new that you can do with it, right? We, there's another platform that we use for doing uh, PGIs, a plan general inspections. Okay. Well, I transitioned that now and using it for industrial hygiene, right? So gathering information on samples and in-field information. Uh, so you, you can use these digital platforms for things that they're not really designed or intended to do. It just takes a little bit of time and creativity. So just think outside the box and, and figure out what you, again, what that roadmap is. What do you want to do in the end and how can you force the, the program to integrate with what you want to do? Yep. Yeah, we've experienced that at with the with one of our platforms we've uh, we found some new and creative uses for it that uh, I don't know that it was really intended for but um, but it seems to be working so far for us it's um, that's great we have about 25 minutes right um, and so I just want to um, you know close with the set of questions um, before the Q a and specifically around challenges or obstacles that you've encountered while implementing uh, many digital programs. Um, and then how have you measured your success so far in, in, in any initiatives that you've done? The, the biggest well, one is, is really having that roadmap. And, and a lot of people, I think when they jump into digitization, they expect it to be a, a complete solution. It's just a tool, right? It's not AI, this isn't Skynet. It doesn't think on its own. You have to input the information to get the output that you want. So having that roadmap up front and, and honestly, I'm storyboarding this thing. And when I started putting these programs into place, I, I was drawing it out longhand with boxes. I guess you could use like a Visio if you wanted to be more professional about it. And, and figuring out what are the pieces that I need to do in order to get this end result. Um, I, I think if, if companies who are producing these digital tools had some kind of of general roadmap system that they could provide to the end user uh, so they didn't have to think of these things on their own, that, that would be helpful. Be, so you don't have to start from scratch because it, it takes, um, unfortunately, uh, you know, some pitfalls, right? I, every, every one of these have, I've done, I've reflectively looked back and figured out, oh, you know, I messed that up or I should have done this or that. Um, so learn from my mistakes and, and come up with a, a standardized plan that at least you can start with something and, and move forward. Okay. Now, I, I agree with with Colin 100%. Again, he stole the world's words right out of my mouth. <laughs> it, it is really difficult. It, and it takes experience to, to figure out and especially moving that, that fundamental mindset from a compliance system to a proactive and value added system is something that a lot of companies haven't done before. 
I, you know, back in the, it feels like years and years ago when I owned my consulting company and I was doing this type of thing uh, for smaller operators primarily who couldn't afford full-time safety people. The, the, the idea of moving from this is what we do for MSHA and regulatory compliance to this is what we do proactively to improve the health, safety, and well-being of our employees had like never crossed their mind. So it, it, it's a transitional thought within the industry. And one of the other things uh, as far as like roadblocks um, is selling it, right? Effectively, again, going back to the, the fundamental differences between engineering and operations, we're we're overhead, right? Well, that's what we do. <laughs> there, there, there's nothing effectively that, that I can do that produces an extra pound of material, right? Because I'm not doing those optimizations anymore. So I'm, I'm an overhead cost. I mean, I'm a preventative cost, but I'm an overhead cost, right? Trying to prevent those, those other iceberg cost effects. So selling a system that is X number of thousands of dollars a year to do reduction in potential issues, um, whether that's injury or compliance, it is hard, right? Because people look at it as this is safety's job. They've been doing this paper thing for years. It works. MSHA is not mad with us. Why are we going to spend this money? So we, we have to figure out those, those hidden values in these systems that approve operational efficiency or the non-quantifiables within the health and safety group. To, to have those interactions and engagements. Uh, that, that's one of the harder transitions, whether it's a learning management system, an incident management system, an auditing profile, because all these things start to add up uh, because they're, they're not really housed within, within one company or one structure. So you end up having a bunch of separate programs, so which increases the overall cost. Um, but we have to be able to, to quantify this in an operational sense, right? So it, it, it all comes back to, Kind of, we're, we're already a sunk time. We, I'm already a salaried employee. This is the time that I have. I'm trying to free up and move those time pieces around so I can add additional value. But these are some of the other benefits to operations, to processing and milling, uh, to our regulatory compliance, or, or even other parts of the world that are outside of the operation, right? Where we're integrating or will be integrating um, routine human resources training and environmental training and the ESG stuff um, that we want people to engage in. So you have to, to look at it from a, a totality inspector, the, the, the holistic business versus just your world. Mm -hmm. And I, I think one thing that boxes on everything that Colin said for that, um, one of the platforms that we're using for uh, even just identifying hazards being on the trying to be on the proactive side of it um the the portal that we're using allows the somebody who finds a hazard to communicate that instantaneously um it also keeps a record of it for us and it allows people who may have been off shift you know if we've got people that are off on their rotation they can come back and things are always missed when we're trying to catch our cross shifts up and, and let them know what's been going on. And, and we found this and we found this. And the, the reality of it is, is that not everything can be fixed all at once. Things have to be prioritized. Um, but letting everybody know what's, what's outstanding. And, and like Colin said, having a, having a roadmap, at least for day-to-day -day operations, you know, ultimately we want to look long, long term, and we want to look at the end game. But we also have to focus on the day to day operations and the shift to shift operations in order to accomplish that long term goal. And having something that the that miners, um, shift supervisors, superintendents can look at and see what what is still outstanding. Um, you know, it, it may be something that doesn't pose an immediate hazard to the to the miners, but it is something that is a hazard that needs to be corrected and is going to require shutting down a crucial area of a, of a mine in order to accommodate that. Well, if we have that list that things are, are still sitting out there and we don't really have to do much more work to, to see that list other than populate it in the first place and then make sure that we can see that things have been corrected or not corrected. That helps us long-term be able to plan for those things and accomplish both goals at the same time, at least in my opinion. Probably a, an overly simplified way of looking at it, but 
it's a it's a way of seeing where we're at and and making sure that we're not missing something. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so we have a couple of questions. So I'll just uh, open it up for questions. Um, so the first one is: um, Does the powder inventory do correct math for the guys? Yes. Uh, the one that we're using, um, the it, it doesn't rely on on having a continual network connection. So it's a it's a form that they fill out. We have QR codes in the magazines that the that the miners can scan with the mobile device. Right now, we're just using iPads. Um, so what it does for the for the guys is it takes out the requirement. Or the, or the responsibility of them having to do math, um, which it, it, it eliminates the penmanship. We have a requirement in every one of the magazines. We have a, a daily summary of transactions. So anything that comes into the magazine, anything that goes out of the magazine, it has to be logged. Part of the problems that we have found in, in the past is that um, some miners are a little challenged mathematically. I happen to be one of those miners. I can't do math well in my head. Uh, and we, you know, so we make sure that we have calculators and that type of stuff down there. Penmanship is a is an issue. Uh, there, there's a lot of things that go along with it, um, but the all of the totals that are going to be there are all in the background. What the guys need to focus on is making sure that they're selecting the correct product. They are inputting the correct information, and they're taking the time to check that information and making sure that it's correct before they hit submit. And then they don't have to worry anything more about it. If everybody is doing that adequately, it's not a problem. And when they come to the surface or they get to an area that has a, has a internet connection, uh, they can open that program up, sync all of the data and everything uploads. We've been using that for a couple of weeks now. We've been checking it on our, on a regular basis and then Checking, uh, checking the magazine on hand inventory, going down and doing physical counts. Um, and, and we found a couple of little stumbling blocks and what we related that to was, you know, call it fat fingers. People are, are in a hurry when they're putting the information in and it, it was easily rectified and easily recognized when, when we started looking for it. But uh, it, it eliminates that aspect for the, for the miners. So, we're still keeping track. We're still meeting all of the requirements, but the the input from the miners has been that it has it has improved their time. Um, they're they're able to go through and do their tasks in the magazine more efficiently, and um, it, and in probably ninety percent of the cases, um, more accurately. You don't have to worry about it being legible or anything like that. Um, and, and then being able to to just pull up the information and calculate it and have it dump into a spreadsheet and make sure that the totals are correct. Even on our end, uh, we go down and, and weekly do powder inventories and do the magazine inspections. Um, just in the last week, we've we've determined that we're we're already shaving probably 30 minutes per magazine off of the time. So it's a it's a total of an hour. Um, and we don't have to come up and really do much of anything else with it. Um, so mm -hmm. as far as the guys, that, that honestly was one of their concerns when we issued it out. How do we make sure that, that the count's correct? The way you make sure that the count is correct is by making sure that the information that you put in is correct. Um, if you do that and everybody does that, there are no issues. Mm -hmm. Colin, do you have anything to say here? No, we, we haven't um, we haven't used the inventory system yet. I, I have seen it before. I think it's a great idea. Anything that we can do to try and minimize those those simplistic errors, and then look at how that integrates into other parts of the business too, right? Um, I, I think that's one place that uh, shameless plug Groundhog is doing very well. Uh, they're they're looking at how they can integrate all these project or uh, programs into a platform for for the mining industry. That that's a uh, a huge problem that I think we've run into is there's a heck of a lot of stuff out there for OSHA. There's a lot of systems and programs and, and things, but no one has has really engaged mining before before Groundhog came along. 
So I, I know that uh, there, there's a number of systems that we're implementing here. We have the, the fleet management and the short interval control that we're working through, and then the learning management system. And you know, talking to the the company and uh, the the developers, there, there's a good roadmap to try and integrate those things together. You know, looking down the road at the long-term vision of okay, if I pull up in my jumbo. I, I can do my workplace exam digitally and send that information out. I have my drill pattern digitally. I can do it there. Drill pattern then it gets sent out to the powder crew that's ready to load. It shows you what you need to extract out of the powder magazine based on the drill plan. They can decline that balance from the powder magazine. And then you have all of these things that are that are functioning together. And now we're we're making things more efficient, we're saving time, and we're, we're making things more cost effective from the utilize, utilization of consumables. So um, I, I'm excited for, for all of these things to start coming together into a system um, as we combine the, the, the platforms. And it, it's been a good working environment too, because the, the company really cares about the mining industry, right? And, and is wanting to integrate and help the mining industry fill some of these gaps uh, to, make, to make us better. And, and uh, you know, I, I do appreciate that because the safety training side, the LMS side specifically, without a digitized platform, we would still be primarily in compliance mode uh, because there, there's such a mo so much more of a work burden that's associated with it. We, we find it hard to be proactive. So it, it's helping people move into that new headspace where we have the ability to be proactive. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, uh, anyone, if you, ha if you have any questions, you can feel free to put in the chat as well. Um, I'll go on to the next question. Um, have you had the need to incentivize people to adopt new systems or change processes? Um, we um, haven't gone to the, the incentive point. We, it's more of an explanation of why it's beneficial, right? I, I, I can't say that I've ever said, here, use this tablet and I'll give you an extra, you know, 20 bucks a shift. Uh, <laughs> it, it's more about how does this help you, right? It's not about helping me. It's not about making my life easier, right? It makes your life easier. It does these things for you. Uh, so we, we have to sell it as a benefit to whoever is, is hesitant. And that doesn't matter if it's a digitization platform, a new process, a new SOP. You always have to sell it as a benefit to the individual. And, you know, Ken, you've been around long enough. You're always going to have that one grumpy guy in the corner who, who isn't going to be on board. Um, we'll deal with that in other ways. But for the most part, you know, we're, we're moving into a, a new generation of, of miners. And I, I raised my hand as part of that millennial Nintendo group. Um, and I love it. And, and, and bringing people who are within my age bracket and category who, who are embracing digitization and embracing the things it can do. Uh, the next step, I think, is putting like Xbox controllers and muckers and things like that. But we'll, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Ken? I, no, I, I think Colin, uh, Colin made a very, very pertinent point there that um, we do have a new generation of miners coming in. And, you know, th there is still the old crusty guy that's got 40 plus years and all he's ever done is paper if he's done that. Um, but the, the new generation of miners has, has grown up with phones or tablets or something in their hands the entire time. It's, it's native to them. And with a, with a little bit of looking at it, you know, they're, they're used to things making it more convenient for them. Um, and, and if we can find something that, that works on a, on a platform that they're familiar with, on a device that they're familiar with, what I've found is that with our younger miners, it's not really much of a sell. Um, if, you, if you can show them a, a few of the bells and whistles and, and let them try it out, and uh, you know, you, it, it's like a raccoon with a shiny object. They look at it and they're like, "Oh, this is really cool." They, uh, they, 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 they take to it right away. Some of the older guys need a little bit more, uh, a little bit more coaxing, um, and, and it really does, like Colin said, it really does boil down to selling it and showing them just, just where they can see those improvements, even, yeah. even just as simple as, uh, as, as being able to, to do an equipment inspection where they have, they, they just have one thing that they have to fill out and they have to su hit a submit button and they don't have to worry about not losing a card or making sure that they have the right card for, for a particular piece of equipment. Um, you know, it, sometimes it's the, it's the little, 
and the the fairly surprising things that are going to get that buy-in from people. Mm -hmm. we, we do have to be a little careful with the digitization part too, and, and make sure that we're uh, we're locking down what needs to be locked down. Yes, <laughs> um, absolutely. You know, I, I've worked for for places in the past where you you have the the new wave who's capable of getting around security features. And the guy sitting there in, in the, the jumbo drilling holes watching the, the football game on Sunday night. So yes. it, it has its pros and cons, right? No, yeah. you're absolutely correct. Yeah, and then there are trends of uh, gamification and virtual reality for you know use being used in training programs. So those are other ways to engage the newer generation as well, right? Yep. Um, anyways, the next uh, question, does the data impute um, in daily records being compared by the system to a master stock data, and does it identify potential issues? As far as the, the training side goes, that data isn't in the system yet. So uh, that's still an external calculation and tracking that, that we do looking at the, the quality of those uh, competency evaluations by those individual metrics, job classification, division, crew, whatever that may be. Um, we haven't had that running long enough at this point to, to draw a real statistical conclusion. So we're, we're still gathering that information um, and, and working through that process. So it, it's kind of the long game, right? So that we have to get enough points on the board to see if those are, are diverging directions or not. So unfortunately, I, I can't answer that uh, yet. Hopefully at, at some point we'll start to see the, either a, a, a coalesce or a split uh, between that information or, uh, you know, in the future, have that stuff available within the system itself so we can have those targeted approaches. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I, I agree with Colin. It's just, at, at this point, we're still developing the system. We're still building everything and trying to get it tweaked to exactly where we want it. Um, you know, and sometimes that, you know, we've, we've got our, our end goals, but uh, sometimes, Sometimes that end goal line moves a little bit, right? Oh, well, we can do this with it. So we end up pushing it out just a little bit more, but we're, uh, we're working towards it. Um, I, I think we, at least for us, I can say that we have a, an end goal in mind, um, but it's, it's still very early in the development. We're still, uh, we're still building the system and still just systematically implementing different portions of it. Um, I don't think we're using all of the, the facets of, of Groundhog that, that Colin is using. Um, I, I know that we're not using portions of it for operations. Right now, it's been pretty much just the safety team, but um, I know that we do have some projects that have been utilizing Groundhog for the operations, and I can't really speak for, for what they found because I'm not that familiar with, uh, with what they're experiencing. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think uh, I think Colin is absolutely right. It's it is too early to tell, um, but I, I am very hopeful that we're going to be able to to see some some. Uh, we're going to get pointed in the right direction just by what we're seeing from the input and from the results more to the point. So we have just about two minutes. Um, so. One last advice, each of you. What what advice would you give give other companies trying to get started with the digital transformation on the safety side? I think some advice that I would give is don't try and do it all by yourself. Um, you know, reach out to people who have a little bit of experience with it. I, I ideally lean on whatever company it is that you're working with. Lean on them. They're the they're the experts, right? You you have an idea where you want to go. They may be able to help guide you along with it. Talk to other people in, in the industry, within your own company, within other companies that have been using something similar. Um, you, you know, our R and D has has uh, has many different terminologies for it: research and development, um, rip off and duplicate, whatever <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Um, but we're, uh, we don't always have to try and reinvent the wheel. Somebody generally has a pretty good idea of where it's going. It might take a little bit of tweaks or a little bit of customization, but don't think that you have to do everything by yourself. And I would add, reach out to your peer groups, right? There, there, there's nothing that I do and nothing that Ken does that's proprietary information. Say, if it protects somebody at my operation or protects somebody at his, 
uh, I'm going to share that document with them. I'm going to share that that pathway or those experiences because you know we're we're all in this for the greater good of the miner. What it boils down to. So there, if there's opportunities within, um, you know, the the suppliers and vendors of these systems to set up set up sharing networks or advice groups or or Q and A between the the different people who are engaged in those products, I think that would be very helpful, right? To to network. Um, from my, my perspective, uh, I think my advice to the companies would be one, uh, do, do an initial gut check and see if this is a direction that you wanna go and is gonna add value to your, your sites. Uh, if you're a small sand and gravel mom and pop with one portable crusher and two stacker belts, you probably don't need to go digital with everything. Uh, you know, it'd be neat if you did, but it, it's probably not a requirement. If you were at uh, where I was before uh, my current operation, where we had 13 mine IDs and 3,000 people, you probably ought to take a look at it, right? And then really develop that roadmap and set realistic goals and timelines. Um, it's mm -hmm. not an easy process. It's not a fast process. It's something that you need to to roadmap out and set those milestones. You know, transitioning from just a document control system that's hard copy to digital, and then integrating the other parts as you move through, and, and have that as a, a realistic expectation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's great. Um, so thank you for um, such a great conversation here. Um, I would um, basically. Uh, you know, we would be doing such sessions again. Um, the next one is going to focus on compliance um, and risk management. So that would be a month from now. I, uh, we, I think it's the Feb 16th that uh, we're planning to have. So we'll send out uh, um, Zoom invites for those. Uh, so please uh, save the date. Um, we will send a recording after this. Um, and if any questions you have, you can follow up with us. So thank you. And thank you, Ken and Colin. Um, this was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.